Bruchem Aboyim, thank you very much for coming. Um, before I begin my lecture tonight, which will be a second lecture on the Shema Yisrael, really actually it's the uh, first was on the first uh, six words, then on the first paragraph, we're now on the second paragraph. But I would like to say something about the opening word of the Shema, Hear, O Israel. And this I had left out of a previous lecture, and I thought it was important to state this. I ran into it in my notes. So when we say the Shema, what we do is we cover our eyes with our hands, with our, with our hand to signify that even in the darkest of times, still God Shema, God hears the voice of every Jew. As per the blessing given to Yaakov, from his father, Yitzchak, Hakol Kol Yaakov, the power of a Jew is in their voice. Again, the idea of prayer. So when, whenever, we cry, whenever we pray to God, not just pray, but kol means a cry. Just a child crying out makes a parent move. And so too with God Almighty. We don't have to necessarily even pray. Just crying out to God is a form of request for God for a parent to take care of a child. Now, the opening line in the second paragraph of the Shema begins with the words, Im Shema Tishmu El Mitzvosai, that if you will, the words again, Vahoya is the first word, and it shall be. This word generally alludes to looking forward to the future, something joyous. However, the joy is conditional. It is dependent on one keeping the mitzvot of the Torah. Im Shema Tishmu al Mitzvosai, that means if you will diligently listen to my commandments. The word im, if, again, is usually translated im as if, however, it is also translated as when. So the words can be telling us not if you listen, but when you listen and comprehend God's commandments, then you will be happy. Now, in theory, this second part of the Shema should be really superfluous. If one accepts the yoke of heaven, which we did earlier, then they've really accepted all the mitzvot. Rav Moshe Feinstein explains that the Torah teaches us this section to impress upon us that it is insufficient to accept the yoke, to accept mitzvot as a yoke, but rather one should accept them with joy. And that is the only way we can observe them completely based on the Tali Orot. Rashi states that if you will listen to the old, then you'll be able to listen to the new. Reino Baki Bechayim explains this to mean that if you listen to God's instructions, his mitzvot, then he will listen to your prayers. And the opposite is also true. If you don't listen to his commandments, he will not acknowledge your request. Now, Panina Militaris 5 states, if you will listen, Im Shamoa to God's mitzvot, then he will help you to continue listening, Tishmau, to his mitzvot. Now starting without continuing is like not starting at all. In some ways, it is actually even worse. It leaves you with the feeling of failure and remorse. We can learn this concept from sports as well as in life itself. Everything, everything is predicated on the swing but even more important than the swing is the follow through. This is a society of fads. People go from one fad to another, seldom feeling the joy of finishing the follow through. Again, what we call success. The second part of the Shema begins in the plural to teach us that mitzvahs done berabim in a multitude, those done in a large group, have more impact than those done individually. An example would be praying with a minyan a quorum of 10 men over the age of 13. As it says, Berov Am Hadris Melech, that in a multitude the king is praised. And it continues with the words of Sharanoki Mitzavah Eschem Hayom, which I command you this day. A person must feel that every mitzvah is only there now, and if he waits, he'll lose the opportunity to fulfill his obligation. One should not look at all the Torah at once. They may become discouraged. Basically, just concentrate only on what you can do today, now. Don't worry about what comes later. Now, in order to serve God properly, one needs to focus, to stay in the moment. 
I didn't start downhill skiing until I was 35 years old. I had a friend who was an avid skier, and again and again he would try to get me to take up the sport. I kept telling him <laughs> I was afraid of heights. If I get on a step ladder, I get the bends. So how was I going to be able to handle a mountain? But he kept after me. And finally, one day I tried to ski. Not only did I find that I enjoyed it, but I became a solid black diamond skier, an expert. I learned a great lesson about life from skiing. The reason I was able to ski is I only look three feet in front of me when I'm skiing. I don't get ahead of myself. With three feet, everything looks flat. I always try to stay in the moment, high yom, today, and not to go too far ahead of myself. If you take the first letter of the words, Mitzvah Eschem Hayom, which I command you this day, so you have a mem, an aleph, and a he, spells the word, the Hebrew word mea, which is a hundred. Dovin Amel, King David instituted the Jews should stay, should say 100 blessings every day. The Shema continues with the words, Li Ahava, Es Hashem Elokeichem, Ulo And to love the Lord your God and to serve Him. Now, we've already been commanded in the prayer to love God. It begins, Vi Ahavta Hashem Elokeichem. So, what's different here? The Torah is telling us that loving God is not enough. It must be connected to action. Ula Avdo. And to serve him. Whatever mitzvah we do, it should be connected to love. One cannot compare a mitzvah that one does out of love to one that's done out of rote, with little or no enthusiasm. Again, as the states, la'avdo, to serve him, people often say, very romantically, they have God in their heart. Sounds very romantic. Imagine, if you had a friend who was married and he had children, and he said to you, I never see my wife, I never see my children, I don't support them, and I really have no real contact with them. But I want you to know that in my heart, I love them dearly. You would call him an idiot. Why would our service of God be any different? Loving God is not theoretical. It demands action. If you talk about or think about eating matzah, for all eight days of Pesach, you've accomplished nothing. You have to actually take a piece of matzah and put it in your mouth. An action. The last word in the Torah that finishes the act of creation, Asher Bar Lokim, the last word is La So, to do. This is a world of action. In fact, it's called the world of Bria. Thinking and talking about serving God is many times the ploy of the side of evil. To make one feel righteous, even though they have really done nothing. As the saying goes, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. If it doesn't connect to action, it's a joke. One should serve God, as it says, with all your heart, with all your soul. And this alludes to serving God with both your body and your soul. Rashi states, a service which is of the heart. What does that mean? That is prayer. Avodat halev is what tefillah is called. The service of the heart. Now why doesn't the second paragraph of the Shema mention Bechoma Odecha? As it does with all your might. As it does in the first paragraph. Which Rashi there says alludes to money. So this paragraph is dealing in the plural with the community. And the community is usually more generous than the individual. Others say that it is included in the word, word nafshechem, your soul. Because those funds support poor widows and orphans. People who abuse them are basically considered murders, murderers. Based on Mengidze Hatik. Now another reason for its omission of the Bechal Modecha is that if all Jews donated all their wealth to charity, it would create a situation which would threaten the very existence of the nation. 
this mesirat nefesh, this putting your life in danger, giving up one's life, is already included in the words, Bukal nafshechem, with all your life. However, in, if an individual were to donate all of his money for a mitzvah, he could still be supported by the community, and he wouldn't die, based on his name of the Torah. Now, heart and soul are within the conscious powers of a person, whereas might is above consciousness. If so, how can we be commanded to love God with all our might? Now, all of us possess a soul which is part of the Shekhinah, the divinity of God. That's who we really are at our core. So this love always exists. We just need to let it surface. But why does the Torah have to command us to love God again? With our hearts and soul to tell us that we should not just love God with the natural subconscious love which resides within each one of us, but that love should inspire us to direct our conscious heart and soul to also love God by knowing Him and emulating His ways based on a discussion by the Rebbe. Now the first paragraph of the Shema makes no reference to reward or punishment. The reason being that when a person is confronted with the vision of God, he needs no other incentive to follow God's will. However, when the service of God is initiated by human reason, then it must be motivated by some incentives that are totally logically oriented, such as reward and punishment. And this is why the Torah mentions keeping the mitzvot, even after you have been exiled. Because based on the first paragraph, which represents a state of mind, we might erroneously conclude that once the vision of God is clouded by the darkness of the galut, of the exile, we would no longer be expected to keep the commandments. But when desire comes from within oneself, then even in the exile, that connection and commitment to God and his Torah still remains, again, based on the Rebbe. Now it continues with the words, V'nosati mitar artzachem bi'ito yorea umalkosh, and I will give the rain of your land in its time, the early rain and later rain. And Rashi states, if you will do what is incumbent upon you, then I will also do what is incumbent upon me. So the vav, v'nosati, adds, rain is not a reward, but something additional. The reward is something that is reserved for the next world, based on an Orachayim. And it says, Be'ito, in its time in Rashi, says, means Balelost, at night. In fact, the gematria of the word Balelot, night, and Be'ito, in its time, are exactly identical. Rashi states that it will rain at night so as not to trouble you. And another interpretation is on the Shabbat, in the evening, when everyone is at, found in their houses. Rashi also states that Yorah is the rain that falls after the sowing, which saturates the earth and the seeds, and Malkosh, Rashi states, is the rain that falls close to the harvest, that fills the wheat in the stalks. Now, going from darkness to spring and fall, these three times that are mentioned in the, in the paragraph, Spring, the time of planting, and fall, the time to reap the benefits of all your work. When God created the world, it states after every day, Vayhi Erev and Vayhi Boker, and it was evening and it was morning. The day, according to the Torah, goes from darkness to light, always with a positive attitude, getting better. Things are always looking up. Whereas the Gentile world begins with day, and ends with darkness. Things always seem to get worse. Now the word be'ito in its time can also be interpreted as natural. Average people who serve God, but not with sincere and deep connection of heart and soul. Or those who are wicked, but not to the extent that they worship idols, are dealt with according to the natural way of the world, whether for good or for bad all in accordance with their ways and their deeds, based on a Ramban. We can also see the connection, the Ito, to the festivals, to the Regolim, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. 
The word be'ito alludes to darkness. Pesach, one of the darkest periods in Jewish history. Shavuot connects to the word yoreh, springtime, a time of birth, the birth of the Jewish nation with the giving of the Torah on Har Sinai, on Mount Sinai. And Sukkot connects with the word Malkosh, fall, a time of reaping, the produce in the fields, a true time of joy. This idea connects with the words of the Shema, Yosafta diganecha v'zirochcha v'yitzarecha, and you shall gather your produce and your wine and your oil, a true time of joy in that you're able in a tangible way to reap the benefits of your work. Now these words are stated in the singular, whereas the whole paragraph is really written in the plural. One might think, hey, listen, as long as most of the Jewish nation are righteous, <laughs> why should I bother to be religious? It will reign in their merit. I'll benefit even though I sin. God says no. Only if you are righteous will you succeed, not because of the merits of others based on the Zanayim the Torah. This is a wonderful and powerful blessing. The fact that you will sow and you'll reap. There's no greater joy in life than reaping the benefits of your own labor. Success. The second Mishnah in the fourth chapter of Pirkei Avot states, Mitzvah goreret mitzvah, that one good deed brings on another good deed and one sin brings on another sin. Same is true of success. One success brings on another success, but one failure brings on another failure. Positive momentum, very important. Small bites, small goals, always successful, never a failure and you'll find life is totally different. The Talmud states that a person would rather have one bushel of his own wheat than ten bushels of someone else's. And we see this scenario even today. There is never a time when you walk into a supermarket that they are out of tomatoes. Yet, people grow their own tomatoes. And it winds up costing them much more money and it requires a great deal of time and effort. However, the satisfaction that they feel is priceless. They usually have more tomatoes than they can use, and they give some to their friends with great pride. And they brag, and they say, just how delicious these tomatoes taste. <laughs> they say to you, taste this tomato. It's great. I mean, it's like gold. You just taste it. It's a tomato, but not to them. To them, it is gold. The blessing includes all types of produce. Anything that grows from the ground. Plants glow, grow in three ways. From the ground you have grains. From a tree you have fruits and oil. And from a vine, grapes and wine. All three represented in the sacrifices that are brought before God Almighty. Again, it's a longer topic, so what I'm going to do you stop here and we'll finish it off at the next lecture. And hopefully by following and listening to what was said, it will help us, help us to bring in Mashiach Sekenu quickly and in our time. Thank you so much for coming and listening. Have a great Shabbat.